24 July 30, 1863 April 7, 1947 was an American industrialist, business magnate, founder of the Ford Motor Company, and chief developer of the assembly line technique of mass production. By creating the first automobile that middle class Americans could afford, he converted the automobile from an expensive luxury into an accessible conveyance that profoundly impacted the landscape of the 20th century. His introduction of the Ford Model T automobile revolutionized transportation in American industry. As the Ford Motor Company owner, he became one of the richest and best known people in the world. He is credited with Fordism, the mass production of inexpensive goods coupled with high wages for workers. Ford had a global vision, with consumerism as the key to peace. His intense commitment to systematically lowering costs resulted in many technical and business innovations, including a franchise system that put dealerships throughout North America and major cities on six continents. Ford left most of his vast wealth to the Ford Foundation and arranged for his family to permanently control it. Ford was also widely known for his pacifism during the first years of World War I, and later for promoting anti-Semitic content, including the Protocols of the Elders of Zion through his newspaper The Dearborn Independent, and the book The Henry Ford was born July 30, 1863, on a farm in Spring Wells Township, Michigan. One his father, William Ford 1826-1905, was born in County Cork, Ireland, to a family that had immigrated from Somerset, England in the 16th century. To his mother, Mary Ford Nalatoga 1839-1876, was born in Michigan as the youngest child of Belgian immigrants her parents died when she was a child and she was adopted by neighbors, the O'Hearts. Henry Ford's siblings were Margaret Ford 1867-1938 Jane Ford circa 1868-1945 William Ford 1871-1917 and Robert Ford 1873-1934. Ford finished 8th grade at one room school, 3 Springwells Middle School. He never attended high school he later took a bookkeeping course at a commercial school. Ford's father gave him a pocket watch when he was 12. At 15, Ford dismantled and reassembled the timepieces of friends and neighbors dozens of times, gaining the reputation of a watch repair man. 5 at 20, Ford walked 4 miles to their Episcopal church every Sunday. 6 Ford was devastated when his mother died in 1876. His father expected him to take over the family farm eventually but he despised farm work. He later wrote, I never had any particular love for the farm it was a mother on the farm I loved. 7 in 1879, Ford left home to work as an apprentice machinist in Detroit, first with James F. Flower Brothers, and later with the Detroit Dry Dock Company in 1882. He returned to Dearborn to work on the family farm, where he became adept at operating the Westinghouse portable steam engine. He was later hired by Westinghouse to service their steam engines. A. Ford stated two significant events occurred in 1875 when he was 12. He received the watch, and he witnessed the operation of a Nichols and Shepard road engine, the first vehicle other than horse-drawn that I had ever seen. In his farm workshop, Ford built a steam wagon or tractor and a steam car, but thought steam was not suitable for light vehicles, as the boiler was dangerous. Ford also said that he did not see the use of experimenting with electricity, due to the expensive trolley wires, and no storage battery was in sight in a way that was practical. In 1885, Ford repaired an auto engine, and in 1887 he built a four-cycle model with a one-inch bore and a three-inch stroke. In 1890, Ford started work on a two-cylinder engine. Ford stated, in 1892, I completed my first motor car, powered by a two-cylinder four-horsepower motor, with a two-and-a-half-inch bore and a six-inch stroke, which was connected to a counter shaft by a belt and then to the rear wheel by a chain. The belt was shifted by a clutch lever to control speeds at 10 or 20 miles per hour, augmented by a throttle. Other features included 28-inch wire bicycle wheels with rubber tires, a foot brake, a three-gallon gasoline tank, and later, a water jacket around the cylinders for cooling. Ford added that in the spring of 1893 the machine was running to my partial satisfaction and giving an opportunity further to test out the design and material on the road. Between 1895 and 1896, Ford drove the machine about 1,000 miles. He then started a second car in 1896, eventually building three of them in his home workshop. Nine. Built in 1891, Ford became an engineer with the Edison Illuminating Company of Detroit. 
After his promotion to chief engineer in 1893, he had enough time and money to devote attention to his experiments on gasoline engines. These experiments culminated in 1896 with the completion of a self-propelled vehicle, which he named the Ford Quadricycle. He test drove it on June 4. After various test drives, Ford brainstormed ways to improve the quadricycle. 12 Also in 1896, Ford attended a meeting of Edison executives, where he was introduced to Thomas Edison. Edison approved of Ford's automobile experimentation. Encouraged by Edison, Ford designed and built a second vehicle, completing it in 1898. 13 Backed by the capital of Detroit lumber baron William H. Murphy, Ford resigned from the Edison Company and founded the Detroit Automobile Company on August 5, 1899. 13 However, the automobiles produced were of a lower quality and higher price than Ford wanted. Ultimately, the company was not successful and was dissolved in January 1901. 13 With the help of C. Harold Wills, Ford designed, built, and successfully raced a 26-horsepower automobile in October 1901. With this success, Murphy and other stockholders in the Detroit Automobile Company formed the Henry Ford Company on November 30, 1901, with Ford as chief engineer. 13 In 1902, Murphy brought in Henry M. Leland as a consultant Ford, in response, left the company bearing his name. With Ford gone, Leland renamed the company the Cadillac Automobile Company. 13 Teaming up with former racing cyclist Tom Cooper, Ford also produced the 80-horsepower Racer 999 which Barney Oldfield was to drive to victory in a race in October 1902. Ford received the backing of an old acquaintance, Alexander E. Malcolmson, a Detroit area coal dealer. 13 They formed a partnership, Ford Malcolmson, limited to manufacture automobiles. Ford went to work designing an inexpensive automobile, and the duo leased a factory and contracted with a machine shop owned by John and Horace E. Dodge to supply over 160, 000 in parts. 13 Sales were slow, and a crisis arose when the Dodge brothers demanded payment for their first shipment. Ford Motor Company in response, Malcolmson brought in another group of investors and convinced the Dodge brothers to accept a portion of the new company. 13 Ford Malcolmson was reincorporated as the Ford Motor Company on June 16, 1903, 13 with 28, 000 capital. The original investors included Ford and Malcolmson, the Dodge brothers, Malcolmson's uncle John S. Gray, Malcolmson's secretary James Cousins, and two of Malcolmson's lawyers, John W. Anderson and Horace Rackham. Because of Ford's volatility, Gray was elected president of the company. Ford then demonstrated a newly designed car on the ice of Lake St. Clair, driving 1 mile 1. 6 kilometers in 39.4 seconds and setting a new land speed record at 91.3 miles per hour 146. 9 kilometers per hour. Convinced by this success, race driver Barney Oldfield, who named this new Ford Model 999 in honor of the fastest locomotive of the day, took the car around the country, making the Ford brand known throughout the United States. Ford also was one of the early backers of the Indianapolis 500. Citation needed. Ford's philosophy was one of economic independence for the United States. His River Rouge plant became the world's largest industrial complex, pursuing vertical integration to such an extent that it could produce its own steel. Ford's goal was to produce a vehicle from scratch without reliance on foreign trade. He believed in the global expansion of his company. He believed that international trade and cooperation led to international peace, and he used the assembly line process and production of the Model T to demonstrate it. 96 He opened Ford assembly plants in Britain and Canada in 1911, and soon became the biggest automotive producer in those countries. In 1912, Ford cooperated with Giovanni Agnelli of Fiat to launch the first Italian automotive assembly plants. The first plants in Germany were built in the 1920s with the encouragement of Herbert Hoover and the Commerce Department, which agreed with Ford's theory that international trade was essential to world peace and reduce the chance of war. 97 In the 1920s, Ford also opened plants in Australia, India, and France, and by 1929, he had successful dealerships on six continents. Ford experimented with a commercial rubber plantation in the Amazon jungle called Forge Lange and was one of his few failures. In 1929, Ford made an agreement with the Soviets to provide technical aid over nine years in building the first Soviet automobile plant gas near Nizhny Novgorod Gorky 98 An additional contract for construction of the plant was signed with the Austin Company on August 23, 1929. 99 The contract involved the purchase of 30 million worth of knockdown Ford cars and trucks for assembly during the first four years of the plant's operation, after which the plant would gradually switch to Soviet-made components. 
Ford sent his engineers and technicians to the Soviet Union to help install the equipment and train the workforce. While over a hundred Soviet engineers and technicians were stationed at Ford's plants in Detroit and Dearborn for the purpose of learning the methods and practice of manufacture and assembly in the company's plants. 100 said Ford, no matter where industry prospers, whether in India or China, or Russia, the more profit there will be for everyone, including us. All the world is bound to catch some good from it. 101 by 1932, Ford was manufacturing one-third of the world's automobiles. It set up numerous subsidiaries that sold or assembled the Ford cars and trucks, Ford of Australia, Ford of Britain, Ford of Argentina, Ford of Brazil, Ford of Canada, Ford of Europe, Ford India, Ford South Africa, Ford's image transfixed Europeans, especially the Germans, arousing the fear of some, the infatuation of others, and the fascination among all. 102 Germans who discussed Fordism often believed that it represented something quintessentially American. They saw the size, tempo, standardization, and philosophy of production demonstrated at the Ford Works as a national service and American thing that represented the culture of the United States. Both supporters and critics insisted that Fordism epitomized American capitalist development, and that the auto industry was the key to understanding economic and social relations in the United States. As one German explained, automobiles have so completely changed the American's mode of life that today one can hardly imagine being without a car. It is difficult to remember what life was like before Mr. Ford began preaching his doctrine of salvation. 103 For many Germans, Ford embodied the essence of successful Americanism. In my life and work, Ford predicted that if greed, racism, and short-sightedness could be overcome, then economic and technological development throughout the world would progress to the point that international trade would no longer be based on what today would be called colonial or neo-colonial models and would truly benefit all peoples. 104 would truly